words before I let uh, Silvio speak, and that is welcome to the third day of our symposium and our last day. And again, I want to give a round of applause to all the speakers so far. And that I'm extremely grateful for all of you who have come from far. I know the traveling these days, again, is a little bit of questionable, but uh, some of you know that I did a lot of emotional manipulation to make sure that you come here in person. And I have proud to say that my powers are still, <laughs> even though my kids have been out of the house for, for a while, I am I'm still good at it. Um, and uh, wonderful. So we have um, an exciting day in front of us. And who better to start than, you know, our very own <laughs> Silvio in the sense that Silvio is a graduate of Berkeley and we were in graduate school together and there's a whole a bunch of people here who are graduate students with us. So who, where are they? Mike Luby. Yay. There he is. <laughs> and then there's a few others. Who, who else is here? Oh, Dan Gusfield. That's right. And Umesh. And Sandy, where is she? And uh, Howard, uh, that's right, Howard, where are you? You even took over our office. And, uh, and uh, Russell, where's Russell? There. there he is, yeah. So, and um, thank you very much. So Silvio, uh, I think yesterday Prasad was, in, uh, was no, I think it was um, Jelani was introducing people saying that they need no introduction. But in the MIT tradition, we say that Silvio because one time Leonid Levin was introducing him or something, he said he deserves no introduction. Um, so it, it was a, you know, a, a command of the English language. But uh, <laughs> Silvio is a, sort of a giant, intellectual giant. And I know this from firsthand experience of, of been working with him for so many years. And uh, his research has been in cryptography in complexity theory, in um, algorithms and mechanism design. And uh, he's a uh, recipient of the Turing Award and many other awards, the BBVA Award and so forth. Uh, and uh, the most important thing is that now what he's gonna talk about is his new passion. And in Silvio's tradition, when he gets into something, he's all in. And um, he will tell us about, we the people agree. Welcome Silvio. Thank you, Shafi. <laughs> All right, everybody, great to be here and uh, back in Berkeley. And so what I want to talk about uh, is um, Byzantine agreement, which uh, was an old subject, right? Is, and they created a true theoretical rage. So um, uh, Shafi and I were, uh, there was a rage about, you know, um, uh, uh, with Manuel about uh, public key cryptography, but there was another rage, which was about the Byzantine agreement. So it was in 1979, pretty much when I first of all uh, arrived to Berkeley, introduced a piece of Shostak and Lamport, and then uh, everybody worked on it. Uh, Lynch, uh, Fisher, Patterson, uh, Michael Rabin with a common coin, uh, with uh, um, 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 Michael Benor, Cynthia Dwork, you name it. It was a god of theoreticians all in love with this problem. And they had the one thing in common to say, this problem is very important. This problem will have great application. This problem, blah, 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 blah. So like in true theory tradition in which you see that something is important because your gut tells you so, okay? And then only later, <laughs> it takes you know, 25 years if you're lucky, 50 years if you're less lucky, but somehow with the fundamental intuition, some actually are proved right. So I'd like to talk because this is the Salmon Institute of Theoretical Computer Science. I mean, not this building, but this is the occasion we are celebrating to tell you about, about this theoretical problem and why it does pop up in the somehow rightfully so in, in practice. So let me start with uh, telling you, I mean, I'm going to be very, very, very rough, right? Because uh, first of all, I have 40 minutes. Second of all, there is, uh, is early in the morning and because the, the, the subject is actually complex. So, but I'm going to be around for, uh, for a while to answer some question perhaps. So what is it, Bazin Delegate? It's a communication protocol. Somehow, and people get together and they start talk, 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 talk to, to each other. And as long as more than two thirds are honest, which means adhere to the protocol, then the guarantees to fundamental properties. Consistency and agreement. Consistency means just in case 
should it happen that every player, some are good and some are bad, uh, you see the picture, right? And uh, that they start with the same value, then at the end of the conversation, all the good players should end in their mind with that value. So if you all start with the same value, we end the same value. Second property, agreement. Even if we start with all random different values, at the end of a conversation, all the good player should stay with this, a common value. It doesn't matter which, because it now it's not defined, right? Everybody starts, but it has to be a common value. So the protocol of saying, no matter what happens, in no time, agree on 27, is this a Byzantine agreement protocol? No, because satisfies the agreement property, everybody has the same value, 27. But it doesn't satisfy that if we start with 53, we should end with 53, right? So it takes a while to figure out that actually this is an interesting problem and that, that, and that is actually meaningful. But somehow you can actually see that is a very premier way to keep a consistent view of the world in the presence of false. So the bad guys can do anything they want. They can coordinate, not coordinate, I think. But at the end, these two properties must be satisfied because it's very important as the original thing to say, if you are going to all attack, there is, this is an order, attack or retreat. If all the good guys attack, they will be victorious. If they all be retreating, they are going to be safe. But if part attack and part retreat, they are going to be defeated. So agreement is crucial, but consistency is also crucial. Otherwise, there is no meaningful. Now, what do we want to agree on? Now, the point that I'm going to make in this talk is that we want to agree on what is the next block in a public chain. Okay, that's what we want to be agreeing. And so he says, well, these problems was, we go back 35 years, he better have actually a protocol for solving. In fact, he have several beautiful protocols, but there are challenges. These protocols were very slow, defined slow. The maximum number of participants in a, pra in a practical setting for Byzantine agreement was 12. 12 in a blockchain where presumably you're going to have a billion people participating. And moreover, the set of player was fixed at defining in our demands. In a blockchain, people come and go, join and leave. No way. So, right? So that is not good. So let me tell you a little bit of the history about this problem. So besides the definition and the first protocol, there is a theorem, uh, Fisher, uh, Lynch, and Patterson, to say, you have to talk a lot. That's why it's law. If you have, say, a million participants, and you suspect that a third is low, you have to talk 300,000, 333,000, blah, 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 plus one times, okay? All right. And turns out that people felt, oh, that is a really a fundamental thing. But if you look at the proof, the proof doesn't say so. Let's assume the protocol is deterministic. The proof took it for granted. But somehow it, the proof only works for deterministic. And then Michael Dan Danor, they say, well, a second, we can do something better with probabilism. We can tolerate, however, much fewer than a third, a quarter of the bad guys. And that is a bit too optimistic. Why? Because, you know, if uh, you have a million play players, one in a thousand can be dishonest. We know that <laughs> perhaps <laughs> this is a bit too opt optimistic. Michael Rabin says, hey, I have a constant round. N over four malicious, a bit not exactly N over three, but that required a trusted third party, which is not easy um, to find. Then uh, somehow that was my first PhD thesis granted to Paul Feldman, then Pesach Feldman. And, uh, and uh, it was a constant round N over three malicious. So that was in the, violated finally was a really n over three is the maximum you can tolerate now you can tolerate it that much in constant round what else you want well the paper was 75 pages long 
and the constant <laughs> was a 6,000. So I talk you to one, two, three, four, five things. Well, what is 6,000 runs of communication among friends, theoretical computer scientists? <laughs> okay, by the way, interesting enough, including um, my uh, protocol uh, there was uh, without the cryptography. And so, and if you used cryptography, cryptography was used by Dolev and uh, uh, in uh, 83, but only two shrink the number of, uh, augment the number of uh, uh, bad guys you can tolerate somehow, not to, to, uh, to speed things up. Things were slow still, but you could tolerate a little bit more. Okay, so that problem was evolving, having you know, papers written, a conference made about it, and so on and so forth. Recently, as you all know, and I took actually notice of this very, very late, maybe five years ago for the first time, I, I, asked, I asked somebody, could you explain to me Bitcoin and what it's about? Okay, so that, but there was a rage going on. And you know, actually, it's a big challenge. So the blockchain, what is the aspiration? The aspiration is a decentralized database. So the, the database is not saying, I have a copy, you have a copy, and, and we update our own copy in such a way to satisfy the following three properties. Everybody can read what is written. Anybody can write an entry in this thing, and nobody can alter what has been written in a block or the order of the block. You say, no, you know, fine. I was, I've seen more challenging things. Well, let me tell you that that is really no, that is a novelty for humanity, and let me tell you why. Everybody of us in this room, as uh, maybe somebody is so young that they never not uh, um, uh, seen it, but I were part of the communication revolution, right? It used to be very hard to, to write things and communicate them. So um, right now, a few years ago, even you take with a uh, push a button and your message, say on Facebook, reaches millions of people. But when you receive such a message on Facebook, do you know? that the entire world has received the same message that you have received? No, you don't. So the difference here is between communication and common knowledge. You see the first property, readable by everyone? That's the toughest one to do. The other stuff, you know, cryptography can make sure that, you know, you cannot alter data. That's what cryptography is good at. But to guarantee that what I see has been seen by everybody on Earth, no matter what, and I can bank on it, that's a different story. That is common knowledge. And by the way, common knowledge is incredible. It's a first for humanity, and particularly in, a, in an age of alternative facts and things, <laughs> it's a very big uh, thing uh, to guarantee. Okay, the potential of this aspirational blockchain is incredible. Who does not like a database cannot be altered? Who does not like transparency? Who does not like the ability? to generate trust among people who barely know each other. However, there is a difference between aspiration and technology. If you launch a protocol and you write blockchain on top of it, it's like to saying, beware of a dog. You don't have a dog. Okay, but another life, you know, if people believe it, uh, they, don't, they leave you alone. So, so it is very good, by the way, as humans, to raise our aspiration as high as possible. That's our duty. But at some point, we've sustained our aspiration with some real technology. Otherwise, our aspiration will remain a pie in the sky. So technology about what? What is difficult here? Not securing the chain. This is done by prehistoric cryptography. Define prehistoric done before Shafi and I had to do anything <laughs> cryptographic, okay? We are in the Jurassic, okay? Good. So the add part is adding the next block, not because I cannot take a block and add it on, because adding the next block means what I'm adding is visible by everybody, and I know that this is the case, and everybody who sees it knows that this is the case. That is the other part. So, so gee, isn't this what we just do by the agreement of a block? But remember, it's very, very, very slow, requires all these other uh, uh, fixed pencil player. No. So how do they solve the problem? Now, first of all, they solve it by PR. They invented a new word, consensus. Sounds good, 
is a very sophisticated world. Everybody says the algorithm of consensus in this blockchain works like this, in this other works like this. Let me tell you right away, consensus is not by something agreement. Whatever it is, let me tell you what it is. So traditional consensus work like this. You see a blockchain, you have to figure out, first of all, to isolate the longest chain consisting of blocks with all valid transactions. Okay, what is an invalid transaction? I make a payment to you for more than the money that I own, that is invalid. Let me give you an example. So this is the longest chain. And so what do you want to do if, if somehow is your turn by whatever algorithm they use to append a block, you should append the block to the longest valid chain that you see. And say, question, what if, if I find two or more chains of equal length, maximum length, and all valid, choose one at random and append that to the, the block, the end. All right, let's say we are whoever has it, proof of work miners, in delegated proof of stake delegates, whatever you want to call them, here is the, the blocks. And so the blue player, assume that uh, is uh, airtime to add it, add of one block over here. And the red player adds a block over there. What? Why? Remember the rule, elongate the longest chain. Why do I'm adding things, you know, a little bit below? Because maybe the blue player says that block BK plus one contain an invalid transaction. So is, is the validity elongate the valid, the longest chain is not valid, but according to him is the longest chain. Whatever is the reason, I didn't see it because when you add a block, right, remember, I have a database in my computer, you have a database in your computer, we update this database, we want to have a guarantee that they are in sync, but they are not in sync simultaneously, right? So he may not have seen block PK, BK plus one. And in such a case, I elongate this. And thirdly, I may be bad, sue me. I had to elongate the longest block? No, I elongated this. But at this point, even though these two blocks are added by malicious people, the next uh, black player here is honest, applies the rule, two longest change, all valid, he appends over there, okay? That's, these are, are the rule. Okay, and what happens to the shortest chain, chain? Eventually vanishes, because if everybody appends to the long, longest chain over there, right? So this guy vanishes with all the payments and all transactions that are contained in it. So in other words, you cannot rely on a block because it may disappear because some other chain can get, you know, from, um, from uh, sneak up from behind and become longer, okay? So therefore, this notion of consensus is a drip, 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 eventual consensus, okay? So let me explain it a little bit better. Here is the semantics. Hey, Jim, all right. Thank you for giving me the occasion to take a drink. I'll be brief, okay? So, okay, so. What is the, this consensus? How can we conceptualize it? Assume that I want to add right now a block, right? So here I think I'm adding a block. Because I'm, I, the order is elongated the valid branch, in, a, in essence, I'm voting that the block before me, I give him a check mark, it's a good block. And by the way, I'm not showing also the one before. If somebody adds a block to mine, it's actually adding another check to that block. And somebody will say, adds another check. Wow, this block of BK, it better be valid because look, one player, two player, three player, vote for it. How many players do we have? A billion. Oh, so what does this mean? One, two, three votes. It means very little. So essentially, how deep should be, in other words, how votes should have collected BK before you feel safe enough to say this block will remain on the chain. Can you ever feel truly safe? No, 
But you know, some of our wide, well, if, if I think it's valid, if you think it's valid, and my wife thinks it's valid, does your spouse thinks it's valid, it better be valid. That's some of the logic. At some point I stop worrying about and, and go with the flow. Why this algorithm of consensus is so, so, so weak? Because Byzantine agreement is hard. That's how people had to do. If we cannot agree, they would do anything to not, not to be linked to an impossible to run Byzantine agreement, right? So, but this algorithm that I show you, this drip, drip, drip consensus, it is the Atlas who is sustaining right now a trillion dollars of market cap. This is incredible. In fact, it is incredible. So this, uh, but that's what it's based on, okay? All right. So ideally, what do you want to do? <laughs> Whoever buys an agreement as a notion, you want to agree on every block. So add a block, I'm, I'm proposing this block, we, the people, agree. Add another block, we, the people, agree. Add another block, we, the people, agree. Is this possible? Yes. But, but we have to do, and I want to prove to you, give you some indication that this is actually indeed is possible, okay? Because now we have to, to we, should, we must reach Byzantine agreement, not between a maximum of 12 people, but a billion people needed, right? It's, but if we can do, we have chains that do not branch, we have a little bit of law and order, we somehow proceed, in a much more rigorous and, and, uh, and conceptually good fashion. So I want to give you an idea of how this is done. And I'm going to give you a choice. Do you prefer the main ideas, that is a right of a relaxing day of the spark, or do you want to see the gory details? I think that the clear idea is that how about the main ideas? Okay. I want to share two very simple ideas because, by the way, the core ideas are always very simple and beautiful. The complexity comes <laughs> naturally, so at least you must stick to, to the core idea. The core idea is very good. So I have a billion people that to agree. I'm going to do it in two steps, right? The first step is that is a player reduction. Somehow I'm going to select 1,000 people out of a billion, but pretty good shrinking of the problem, right? Is an order of uh, f 10 to the three, right? three orders of magnitudes, not bad. Second, well, a thousand people reach agreement is also very hard. So I had to solve another thing, to solve Byzantine agreement, which is good enough to agree in one second between a thousand people all over the earth. That is a two problem. I want to show, give you some idea to do this. Let me tell you about the player reduction. It happens in three magic places. The magic is going to be replaced by math, but it's easier to think about magic. Phase number one, about a thousand players are publicly randomly selected among all these billion players. How? By magic. Among these thousand players, there is a two thirds honest majority in the selected committee by magic. And then this committee runs Byzantine agreement and propagate the digitally signed result. So assume now that you know who these 1,000 committee members are by hypothesis. And then you see a block which has, say, the signature, digital signature of 700 of these 1,000 people that you know what they are. That is the next block. There cannot be another, right? Because you can have a two overlapping majority. That's, that's the idea. Good. S still in the magic phase, let's do some sanity check. Remember, we must satisfy consistency. So let's assume that among the billion people, somehow everybody started with the same value. Okay. Now I have this committee with about a 1,000. But if everybody starts with the same value, no matter how you choose the committee, in this committee, everybody starts with the same value. 
and therefore, after these 1,000 people run Byzantine agreement, all the owners will agree on that value. And then once they sign it, and they are in a great supermajority, and you see a block signed by this committee with a supermajority, then you know that is the block. And therefore, all the billion people stop too. So first I think, I let a, a committee figure it out. The committee figures out the same thing that I think, and I agree on what the, committee, the majority of the committee has said, the end. But consistency works. About agreement, we start with all kinds of different values. Well, we get a thousand people, but now they also have a random values in their heads. But the Byzantine agreement means that if there is a honest majority, they will agree on the same value, and therefore everybody will agree on the same value too. Wonderful. Well, how about honest majority? Well, here I'm a cheater a little bit, right? So I have to lose a little bit. I must assume that not two thirds, but say something a bit more, anything epsilon more would work, but say three quarters are honest. Then at this point, you know, that's why when 1,000 is needed, you want to, and 1,000 is, don't hold me on it, is uh, 3,000, it doesn't matter what is uh, all one among theoreticians. So is 1,000, I want to guarantee that there is going to be a honest majority. Okay, what is the probability that I want to guarantee that in the committee there is an honest majority? We chose an algorithm way if the probability is of not having an honest majority should be one in 10 to the 18. 10 to the 18 is a very strange number. Of course it is, because I made it up. But let me tell you why I made it up. Because I'm saying that 10 to the 18 happens to be the, the amount of seconds from the Big Bang until now. So if you produce one block a second, which is a very good clip, you have to wait for the age of the universe for something going wrong. With these type of things, everybody agrees that it doesn't matter anymore. Very good. So, and once you have a two honest majority, you have a, a, an agreement, and therefore done. Good. How the hell we do this player reduction? Who randomly select a home, right? That's what they have to do, from a billion player to a million. No one. So the way Algorand does it is that these committee members secretly select themselves. That means that in the privacy of my computer, you in the privacy of your computer, you run a cryptographically fair lottery. In fact, let me tell you what that means. In which the probability of winning in this particular example is one over a million. So a billion divided a million is roughly where 1,000 that you want, right? And I cannot cheat because it's a cryptographic fair. So even if I have a national state full of super, super, super computer, I cannot choose. So think about it that uh, I have a, a lever of a cryptographic slot machine. I can lower the level only once, two cases. If I lower and lose, nobody is going to listen to me at all. If I lower and win, I get a winning ticket, namely a mathematical proof that I'm part of this committee. And I and whoever else exhibits this proof, we are going to discuss to agree. We are going to conduct the Basel Agreement. That's the idea. Okay, and this is super fast. Why? How long does it take me to lower this level? One microsecond of computation. Nothing. All right. So then, uh, okay, now I have uh, somehow give you an idea. Now I have a fast and big committee. Now, this fast and people have to agree. How the hell do I do it? So let me tell you in a way that actually, once we do it, we do it in three rounds. Well, let's give, be generous. We give it a six rounds, okay? Not a problem. And uh, we can tolerate another three. And by the way, this is not blockchain grade, not because of the three, but because we are going to make a lot of simplifying assumptions. And that again is what theory really does. The, 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 the genius of theory is to figure out the level of discourse very often. How much you should get a model that is rich enough, meaningful enough 
to find the brilliant idea that we come up with and is our job. And then having the idea that once we solve in this model, we can actually enlarge it. And it's really an art more than a science to find where the model is. So the model, I'm going to make you know, simplification in the communication, in the adversarial model. I'm assuming that these values can be arbitrary values like a block is a bit, is at zero one. That's another big simplification. And then I'm going to make my assuming that I have this magic coin available to describe the zest of the idea. Okay, let me tell you about the model. The model is the complete synchronous network. Let me start with complete. Every player is in this theoretical model, is joined by a secure channel with any other player, which with four is easy to draw. With a billion, is a bit, uh, or even a thousand, is a much different graph. It's totally unrealistic. Furthermore, the network is synchronous. What does it mean? That at every clock tick, I post a message for you, for you, for you, for you. And at the next clock tick, pack, the message is received and altered because it comes from me, right? So, and nobody has seen it. Is it because it's in a private channel? All right. So in the adversarial model, the adversarial model says he can corrupt at the beginning a third of us and no more. At the beginning, Cecilio, I know, adversarials how to be dynamic. But we had to start with somewhere, okay? Because to describe something simple, this adversary has decided who is bad and who is wrong, and then now he cannot change his mind. Okay. So over on this, the adversary controls, coordinates, um, um, he sees all the good, good messages before he's seeing what is the bad messages is very strong. But to be clear, because each player plays as a dedicated line, if the adversary wants to hear to this conversation, he must either corrupt this player or corrupt the other player at the end of the line or corrupt them both and cannot stop a message from good player to good player, nor can inject messages in a secure line, right? So, and when you, player I, receive a message on the channel I to J, you know that this message come from player J. See, that actually captures what really is different in, a, in the distributed computation, because I receive something, I know it comes from you, but I don't know if others are receiving the same thing that I'm doing, right? Because all this in this private channel, this simplification of the model has the richness of the problem, and yet it's so simplified that we can actually tackle it. All right. The model is tricky enough. Okay, so now I'm going to remember this simplification, right? The common coin, I called it before. Magic coin is now. What is a magic coin? Is a coin with us two label, two, two faces, zero or one. At each round, the magic coin is spun and a random bit, golden BR, a round R, appears to all players. Ready, go, spin, boom. In this case, the coin end up zero and all player, good, bad, the coin is in the sky, think of it. Everybody can see it, it's zero. Okay, it could have been one. So that is a simplification. Okay, what, uh, what is the round R of the magic coin protocol? What should play I do? Now, every, every theory talk should have. That is the beautiful things of model. Then you want to confuse people because you make sure that there is theoretical death in <laughs> whatever you're doing, otherwise you don't have a job. Okay, I'm not going to do any theoretical deaths, but still at this time of the day is a little bit of thinking. Sorry for straining it all. About the two, three neurons that I'm available at, at this time, you know, I will be strained. So be patient with me if you're strained. That's the only reason, okay? Then you can go back to sleep. So at the beginning of the R, I have a coin that I've inherited from the previous round. I call it BI and play I, R minus one. Now, my question is, I see this coin locally in my computer. Is this the same bit that everybody else does? I do not know. Therefore, I'm going to, to say, what does it mean to be the same bit? That bi plus one is equal b 
k r minus 1 for all k. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to send my latest thought of what my bit candidate for a bit to everybody. Everybody does the same. So I immediately at the next clock tick, what happens? I receive what people tell me was their latest candidate bit, allegedly. Why? Because people can lie, people cannot send anything at all, and I have an empty message, and so on and so forth. And now I also receive, I look up in the sky and I look at my magic coin, BR. And now I do decide on a round R coin as follows. If I receive a bit B from at least two thirds of the people, I decide, I, I set BR plus one to bet B. Else I choose the coin in the sky. Okay, send, receive, do ever a candidate of two thirds majority, that is my decision. I don't have three hundred majority only, I do it in the sky. You may have a different samples, that's okay, but that's what I do, very simple. What's the meaning of all this? Here is the meaning. Let's assume that around R minus one, we are in agreement. Everybody has the same bit. Then what happens? All good people start with the same bit, the number of good people by definition is greater than two thirds. All the good people send two thirds. Therefore, all the good people receive the same bit B from two thirds. And therefore, all good people decide on B independent on what the coin of the sky zero one doesn't matter. In other words, if we are already in agreement, then we stay in agreement. I said, this is good. Well, if we are not in agreement, then what happens? Case one, no good player K receives a bit B with two thirds majority. Okay, let's see that no good player. I'm good, I don't have a two thirds majority. You are good also, you don't have the majority. What do we do? Then all the good players end up with a bit in the sky, which by definition is the same for everybody because that's the magic of it. Then we agree in major probability one. That's case one. What is case two? Well, what is the opposite of no good player? Some good player. K receives a bit B with two thirds majority. Some other player may also, may not, who knows? But then that player, right, ends up with a bit B if somebody has received a two thirds majority. But then I claim that no other good player K prime receives the opposite bit with two thirds majority. Why? Because <laughs> if I receive a bit B from more than two thirds, remember more than one third are honest people. So that people, they say that bit B, anybody else has two thirds minus one for the opposite. You cannot have two thirds. And therefore, if, the bit in the sky ends up being equal to this bit B, which has probability half, we are in agreement. So in other words, if we are not in agreement, either in case one, we agree probability one, or in case two, we agree probability half. The end, isn't this simple? Very simple, because there's this magic coin in the sky, but that was all, right? Okay, so, well, if you have paid attention, is to say, if we are in agreement, we stay in agreement. If we are not in agreement, we will get in the agreement. But how do I know when we are in agreement? I don't. That's a problem. I agree. We have to do better than that. And second of all, magic coins? Where? <laughs> That's a, a very big help. Okay. So let me tell you that we could do with less magic coins. Less magic coin is a coin that is spun at every round. With probability two thirds, the same random bit is received by all. And here is a good magic case. Everybody gets this bit zero because the coin is zero and it is semi good, right? And then with probability a third, no coin or no coin appears in the sky, or the coin is not random or not is not received by all, or different people receive about people, the hell can go loose. So with two thirds, 
there is a good coin and everybody receives and it is round and one third, anything you want. So here is a, for instance, a, a, a bad magic case. People get the random stuff. Somebody gets nothing, somebody gets zero, somebody gets one. Now, what is the claim? The claim is with a less magic coin, we can still get in agreement, but not with probability a half, but with probability a third. Good enough. And the second claim is that the less magic coins are actually cryptographically implementable and implementable fast. Okay. It's amazing, right? So you go from something which is very simple, can't possibly get it. So something which is almost as magic, this you can get and you can get it quickly. Okay, I'm going to show whatever happens, this, but remember, that is synchronous complete network. So the Algorand agreement, that is the Jim Micali agreement who is Jing. Jing is uh, the chief scientist at Algorand. Hi, Jing. So, and what do we do? We had to overcome a few things. First of all, we must go from Byzantine agreement, five minutes, perfect, I'm, you know, in my old age, I arrive early and I finish on time. I know I'll surprise Shafi. Maybe I should make a six minute to, to be a, according to tradition. Okay. Then the, the communication model is really adversarial. Then the bad guys, the, the, the player set is not fixed, but changes over time. The adversary is dynamic. The, uh, we can detect determination. And so but, and most of all, we have this beautiful player replaceability policy that nobody realizes why it's needed, but is really the crack of the argument and is actually faster. So we're going to do in three rounds rather than six. And a bunch of other things. Good. So let me jump to conclusions because I want to prove that I can finish in five minutes. You know what? That means that practice needs a theory and vice versa. You didn't get the joke, but and vice versa. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> because the practice in the theory events is guaranteed. Well, we have a theory in its practice, with, uh, we don't know. But we'll make it true. Because if you notice that, you know, how did we go about this, this stuff to solve a really important problem, like creating common knowledge with humanity? That's what the blockchain is. We went from this. 35 years ago algorithm, dream up to a bunch of theoreticians who had the gut feeling that that was an important problem. And an entire community of students, colleagues, and everybody else felt they were right. Nobody had an idea what the application was, but it was in my guts that that was a good problem. And how do they go about it? They chose a model which was captured the essential parts, and you can reason about it, and then you can enlarge it. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is really the gift of theory. And in particular, this is the gift of theoretical theory, <laughs> a computer scientist. So I'd like to honor Jim and, uh, and Dick and Shafi for these, uh, ten, these wonderful 10 years at the Simons Institute for theoretical computer science. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Dick. Thank you, Shafi, for taking us a good shower for 10 minutes. So, but this, let's remember, we are celebrating these 10 years because this is the beginning of a long series. So I'd like to look, go forward, onward. May this institute be honored so long as making signs and lovingly handed down to future generations remain honored value. And all this, we can actually agree. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, thanks, Silvio, for a beautiful talk. Uh, it's actually very striking to me because, you know, I was never convinced in the long ago, as you said, uh, you know, it seemed to me Byzantine agreement was theoretically very interesting, but the motivation always seemed a little bit uh, 
lacking to me. So this is this is fantastic what what you've done. So the the question I have is this: you know, it's clear that you know what what you've done is you've you've met a real need here in the sense that. So in, the mask is interfering. Ah, sorry. What, what what's clear is you've met a real need here in the sense that, you know, what what Bitcoin does with proof of work is just, I mean, it's it's just crazy in 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 some sense and. Here you have an algorithm that's practical, that's uh, theoretically guaranteed. And obviously it's successful in the sense that you have a company which is successful, but what keeps it from just being, you know, as a theoretician, I would say, look, you've solved the problem. Shouldn't it just sweep away all the, all the competitors? <laughs> well, what's, what's going on? I, I, well, I'll tell you, but it reminds me that uh, when uh, Shafi and I were graduate students here, right? And, uh, and, uh, and uh, public key cryptography was uh, coming up, we felt, you know, gee, this is going to conquer the world, right? We are going to have everybody public key, digital signatures, secure protocols, uh, um, 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 uh, zero knowledge proof, blah, 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 blah. We are going to, you know, year one, nothing. Year two, nothing. Year three, nothing. Our students, well, they found a job maybe in industry by hooking wires for security and not proving anything anymore. So year 10, year 20, year 25, something starts happening, okay? And then by now, but you know what really made the, the stuff work? Here is a blockchain. Because all of a sudden, they really needed to have public key, not clear, but didn't want to be certified by anybody. Actually, you, you want to be a pseudonymity. So it was a very, important lecture for me, a lesson for me in life. So when I saw Bitcoin, and I agree with you that it's a beautiful idea and a beautiful philosophy behind it, but you know, inelegant solution to say the least, I say, you know what, let me did it. So I did whatever a theoretician does. I closed myself in a room for a month, just asked my wife, is there no time for dinner, time for that, solution. Okay, so then what? I decided, do I want another 25 years? You know, I may not have another 25 years. So all of a sudden I decided, you know, I'm going to roll my sleeve and I, and, and I do it because it is incredible. Good ideas latch on eventually, but we have no control. Keynes used to say that the market can remain irrational <laughs> much you know, later than you remain solvent. So very often, so sometimes you know, the same thing happens here. You ultimately good ideas latch on, but we don't know when. And so sometime, you know, it, it, when you think of it is really important, just to do it yourself, at least, you know, that's what I, I decided to do. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.